Welcome to the Business Mechanic Show, where we tune up your business strategy and rev up your leadership skills. I'm your host, Vaughn Sigmund, co-founder of Results Driven Leadership, the go-to place for companies looking to supercharge their management team's performance. If you're hungry for actionable insights to improve your leadership style, you come to the right show. And today's show is one I think is going to be particularly impactful for just about anybody who got attracted to this title today. We'll be we'll taking a deep dive into the lessons learned from the groundbreaking book, Extreme Ownership. I haven't done this very often, but this is a book that I think is so pertinent, especially in today's world where more and more there is apparent a leadership void. People are struggling more and more with being effective leaders. And I think these simple lessons that come from Jocko and Lee from the Extreme Ownership book is going to be very pertinent to you. But we're not just going to talk about the book. Of course, we're going to be taking a step further in this. I'm going to share my own leadership experiences, primarily learned, since there's a correlation here, from my Army veteran father and how those lessons have influenced my business strategies and how I teach these lessons to other business leaders like yourself. I'll also later in the podcast share Jocko's five tactics for effective leadership. So stick with this show today to get the most out of it. So if you're ready to take ownership, to learn how to discipline, balance, create strong relationships, all that will dramatically improve your leadership skills and your team's performance, then don't miss today's show. Let's dive in. Let me start by this. My journey, a little background, my journey with leadership goes a long way back. My personal genesis was founded on being raised by a 30-year-plus Army veteran one who received a Bronze Star, a Purple Heart, back during World War II. He was in the European front. And I've had the privilege of learning about leadership from a very early age. I got attracted to be a leader from almost as far back as I can remember. I wanted to be the class president in first grade. I wanted to lead people. But... I had to learn how, and I've had a lifelong journey, and my father's influence has guided my 40-plus year business career, all enabling me to develop and refine my frontline leadership style of business. So alongside these lifelong lessons, I've drawn from his inspiration, from his military leadership philosophies. I also am fascinated by other military leadership philosophies, and they were particularly well articulated by Jocko Willis and Leif Babin's book, Extreme Ownership. If you haven't read it, I'll put a link in today's show notes. It's Extreme Ownership how U.S. Navy SEALs lead and win. It's part of our military power we should be particularly proud of. The Navy SEALs, Delta Force, all the best of the best. So let's talk about leadership under extreme conditions. I want to start with this story. It's one of my favorite stories out of the book, and I've repeated it in many situations. It starts with Leif Babin's experience. Of course, being a Navy SEAL, he experienced the challenges of Hell Week twice. Once as a candidate, and then as an instructor observing new generations of Navy SEAL candidates. And if you're not familiar with Hell Week, it's a grueling five and a half day event where Navy SEALs, basic underwater demolition, SEAL training, or BUDS, is designed to filter out those who aren't mentally or physically up to the task. I'm not going to go into detail on that, but they go on, undergo a litany 
of physically exhausting activities, perhaps none more telling than the boat races, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about a story from that. Candidates, they're, they're grouped into boat crews and subjected to a series of races. And they paddle these heavy inflatable boats. They paddle these heavy inflatable boats over considerable distances. And the instructors had the teams engage in a constant stream of these boat races, requiring the teams to carry their boats on top of their head to shore, from shore to the ocean, back from the ocean to the shore, paddle these boats to a specific marker, dump themselves out of the boat, get back into the boat, and carry through a path to the impact back on land. The SEAL candidates are grouped, so you get a little better picture of this, by height into these boat crews to carry this boat properly. There's seven man crews, and they're using, they're assigned these World War II relic inflatable boats that they weigh more than 200 pounds. And within these groups, the most senior ranking sailor becomes the boat crew leader. And they're responsible for receiving, transmitting, and overseeing the execution of the lead instructor back on shore's orders. So during one of these exercises, this is where the story comes from, there becomes this clear pattern that begins to emerge as these race races proceeded. And Babbitt writes this in his book, Boat Crew Number Two, after several races, was almost guaranteed to come in first place every race. And then Boat Crew Number Four was almost guaranteed to come in last place. And Babbin and the most experienced instructor there in attendance that day back on shore, who Babbin calls his senior chief, kept their eyes on the leader of Boat Crew 4. What's happening there? An experienced officer who kept losing his cool every race. And of course, that kind of behavior Contrary to what some may believe, that kind of behavior is completely unacceptable for a SEAL. Babin and the senior chief decided to run a little experiment, try a little leadership experiment. So at the end of a race, before they started the next race, they announced they're going to switch leaders. Boat crew two, the winners, were going to switch to boat crew four. Or four was going to be switching to two. But after they switched these two crew leaders up over the next hour of races, guess what? Boat crew two, who has the now losing leader on board, never took first place again. They did well, but they did not come in first place like they had numerous times before. And boat crew four, all of a sudden, remember, they were the losers. Every single race, they were guaranteed to come in last. All of a sudden, with this new leader, boat crew four won nearly every race. They often, we believe that it's the team members that are going to drive the performance. This was a, and I've seen it happen. I can tell you dozens and dozens of stories where I've experienced this same phenomenon. Many people believe it's the team, it's the individuals within the story that make all the difference, and it's not. You might doubt this, but I'm telling you, the proof is not only in this story, but it's in my own experience. I could take a problem, challenged, underperforming store that had every problem in the world, change one person, the manager, and all of a sudden that store performed like it's never performed before. I read dozens and dozens of examples of that leadership makes all the difference just like it did in this example from Lee's book. So let's take this military experience and bridge this battlefield to the boardroom. The co-writer, Jocko Willenick, 
who happened to be Babin's former commander, he often, Jocko often speaks about how leadership traits honed in the military translates to civilian life. That's his business today. So widely known public speaker. He's got a great podcast, great YouTube channel. It's where I was first introduced to him years ago. He's a fascinating guy. And his message is clear. We solve problems through leadership, through interacting, through this leadership, interacting with other human beings. And he also teaches what I promised earlier, are the five tactics for effective leadership. He boils down all the complexities of effective leadership into five primary tactics. If you've listened to a lot of these podcasts, you've read my blogs, you've watched the videos, you've heard me say this before, a lot of the things I've talked about are in this book. First one, first tactic of effective leadership is listen. I cannot stress how simple sounding that is, but how hard it is for so many leaders to perform listening. It's more than a passive activity. It's an underrated skill that significantly impacts the outcome of any mission, whether it's in combat or a corporate environment. In a modern, decentralized workplace, it's absolutely crucial for everyone to have a say. In today's world, everybody has to say have a say. Command and control and one-way leadership is a dinosaur. And you have to adopt the new way of leading teams. And a big part of that is your ability to listen. It's essential, but it's often overlooked. I had a conversation, long conversation, almost two hours with one of my coaching clients on Friday. He's an emerging leader, really struggling with this. It's often our self-esteem as new leaders that drive this command and control. We just want to get things done. And we only have one tool, and that's what our instincts tell us to do. And your instincts are generally wrong. You cannot tell people what to do. You have to give them instructions. You have to give them the task and direction, but you can't tell them to do it. You have to inspire them to do it. And your ability to listen goes a long way to motivating and inspiring them. It's very overlooked listening skills, but it has the potential to dramatically affect the outcome of both military missions and business endeavors. And Jocko emphasizes in his teachings advising leaders to adopt a decentralized command, better known as empowerment. Take this decentralized approach that allows for input, collaboration, feedback from all the team members. That's how the SEALs do it. They're trained, they're knowledgeable, they want to learn from each other. And before a commander, for a leader, sets him off into very dangerous situations, he wants to make sure he's got everybody's knowledge and understanding, their input, and sign off, buy in. He wants that feedback. That's a sign of a very healthy ego and self-esteem that you can listen to others. It's confidence. But however, listening goes way beyond merely hearing what others are saying. It's about understanding the nuances. This was a big part of the discussion I had last week. It's about listening and understanding the nuances, asking probing questions, not thinking about how you're going to respond to this idiot's statement about something. And I say that to get attention. It's not about just waiting for you to prove your point. 
and how right you are. It's never about being right. It's about getting the job done. And you have to ask probing questions. You have to listen and genuinely consider others' viewpoints. That's a decentralized command or collaboration where this hierarchical chain of command is flattened out. That's what works effectively in today's world is a flat command chain. And team members can both physically be dispersed, but mostly you're gaining their intellectual knowledge, their experience, because they must be aligned with your mission, with your task, your goal. And you have to seek that input. If you're not doing that, you are limiting the impact of the productivity your team can have. And for this to happen effectively, listening has to be proactive. It has to be part, you have to know going into it that I must listen to everyone and pick up on all these nuances. It forms the basis of trust. And that trust is essential to ensuring that everyone feels that their input is valued, which thereby encourages more open dialogue. The more you encourage it, the more you listen, the more you take advice, utilize others' advice, not all of their advice. I'm not talking about it. everything goes into the pot and gets used. you got to filter through some of it, absolutely. But in my own leadership development, both how I was developed and how I teach others, was heavily influenced by watching my father. And from that, I've continued to hone over 40 years in my frontline experience, listening. It's a cornerstone. It's a, been a cornerstone of my ability to effectively, it was I perfect. Hell no, I was never perfect. But I was better than most at this particular skill. And it allows for mutual respect. In order to be respected, you have to respect and understand that respect turns groups, your team members into a cohesive, effective team. There's a lot in there. But step one, listen. Number two, number two, build strong relationships. I'm not saying being friends. I'm saying professional relationships. They are the bedrock of effective leadership. If we have good relationships, trusting relationships, open relationships, mutually respectful, and we trust each other, we listen to each other, and we can influence each other in making decisions based on this shared common knowledge, knowledge I call it the collective pool of knowledge, Others call it something similar, sometimes different, but it's if, if I'm collecting this pool of knowledge, everything comes out better, including people's willingness to perform at a high level. It's not an ancillary aspect of leadership. It's fundamental to achieving collective success. Remember, we all have to be successful together. And Jocko underscores this intrinsic value of solid relationships. He highlights the symbiotic relationship of trust, effective communication, which we're going to talk about within a team. The team members have to rely and communicate with each other. And you as the leader create that conduit and that willingness to do. And when you have good relationships, they don't have to love each other. They have to respect each other. When we have good relationships among team members and leaders. It fosters this fantastic environment of mutual respect and open dialogue. And in this space, trust becomes the currency that enhances every interaction. This allows for constructive listening, 
meaningful influence, both on you and on others, and collaborative decision-making. Set it again. And if you emphasize relationship building with your team, it will resonate deeply with them. And I watched it with my father. The relationship, he was their boss, he was their leader, but he knew them, he listened to them. He gave them breaks. He overlooked when he needed to. He chewed ass with the best of them, believe me. But watching him in the time, the short time that I have with him in this world, I learned a tremendous about him. this particular topic. Good relationships are not built overnight. They require consistent effort to gain these shared experiences mutual respect, continuing and ongoing work to understand each other's perspectives. Your way is not the only way. Give that up, please. Because the reward, if you do so, is immeasurable. Because a team bound by trust and mutual respect is so much better equipped to face challenges head on to solve complex problems, to think collectively, and ultimately to achieve the objectives, your goals. So please, as a leader, invest your time and energy into building strong relationships with your team. They do not have to go to the happy hour with you. It's not like they're coming over for parties. That's not what I'm saying. It's getting to know them, supporting them, knowing what their goals are, supporting them in their goals, being respectful and trusting of them. It's not a nice to have. It's a must have. It's an operational imperative for any leader that wants to commit to excellence. Number three. Number three tactic. Practice discipline. Now, that may sound on the outside a little differently than what discipline really is, but it often is misconstrued as rigidity or authoritarianism. It's not what it is. I'm not contradicting myself. It's actually being a liberator. It's about setting boundaries within which creativity and innovation can flourish both for the leader and the team. See, discipline is the unsung hero of effective leadership. While many people associate with rigidity or top-down approach, command and control, authority, I have found that in alignment with my team, which is Jocko's philosophy as well, watching my father's military approach, that discipline is the catalyst to freedom because it establishes the framework and the boundaries to make it clear what is expected. There we go. There it is. It's clear what's expected within those boundaries. It's the standards of which we behave, standards which we perform, but with enough freedom that individuals are free to innovate, to think creatively, Thus, excel. A disciplined leader ensures clearly that their team knows their objectives, knows the guidelines, knows the rules within which they operate. Standards drive success, but they have to be clear. They have to be fair, fairly applied. People need to be held accountable, discipline, accountability. That drives success, but it's not authoritative. you got to remove any ambiguity. You can't be different. You can't apply the rules differently to different people. You can't be a different leader on different days, depending on your mood. Because when they know what the boss is going to expect, what the boss is going to do, unbelievably increases efficiency. 
and you get all that emotional energy out of fairness and the boss is in a bad mood and unapproachable, all that crap out of the way, then they focus their energies on the task at hand. What really matters, getting the job done. And in a disciplined environment led by you, there's no second guessing of what should be done. We all know what needs to be done because that's how we do things around here. Everybody understands the role. They practice the role. They understand the processes. And they understand how their role, what they deliver, aligns with the larger mission. Do you have a mission in your organization? Do you have a mission for your team? If not, please go listen to my podcast on that. Because through discipline, a leader can create a sense of order. That's what we need in life. A sense of order that not only keeps us aligned, but it also allows the freedom to take initiative. This authoritative approach that so many unknowing leaders, young, undisciplined leaders, they stymie initiative. Think about that. If it's only your way and you don't care about listening to them, you don't have a relationship with them, why in the world would they take initiative to try something when they know you're going to squash it? So it should not be viewed as a limitation, but it's a structured pathway to success. This is how we do things. But everybody's had a say in how we do things. And it's very clear that we all do it the right way every time with our own innovations that get us in there. That's a very complex topic. We can talk about that later. Number four, tactic number four, strike a balance. Balance, particularly emotional balance is critical. I alluded to that previously. They must know, your people must know what boss is going to show up every day. If they're walking on eggshells, if they're concerned, ever have a concern that if I say this, they're going to lose their crap or I'm going to make them mad. That is horrible leadership. But if you're open, you've got a good relationship, you listen to people, and you don't act like a fool if something rubs you the wrong way, that's the balance. That's when people really come to you with great ideas and deliver extreme performance for you. Extremes on either end of the emotional spectrum, bad things. It jeopardizes your effectiveness and it ruins team dynamics. I... I mention this all the time, so I know I'm repeating myself. I ask that question, who's the worst boss you ever had in every interview? And this always comes into that description of the worst boss. So I've never knew what to expect out of them. They were hard to predict. I never knew how they react to things. Their standards changed from minute to minute. Their standard was different for me to somebody else. And most importantly, they lost their temper. They lost their temper. You And listen, I've lost my temper. Guilty as charged. We're all just human. So you're not going to be perfect. I certainly was not am still not perfect. But as long as that is a very rare occasion, you're winning the game. Because striking this balance is pivotal, 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 is pivotal in leadership. And again, it's a lesson I've internalized from watching my dad. And also it's widely espoused by Jocko. Emotional balance is especially critical when something bad's happening. 
you got to be the steady rudder. You cannot be volatile. You cannot be unpredictable. On the other hand, emotional detachment, like you don't care. I can't tell you that this is another one of those descriptors of the worst leader somebody's ever worked for. So they never spoke to me. They walk in the office. They walk by a dozen people, never make eye contact, never say hi, never acknowledge certain people existed, only their favorites. When you're emotionally detached like that, you have no emotion that's just as damaging. So being overly emotional, having no emotion, both very bad things, that undermines your team's trust in you, thus their performance. So as a balanced leader, you must understand the importance of modulating, modulating your emotional responses. Count to 10. And even the good stuff, you need to have emotional responses to good things, but not over the top. It's different situations. Both on the analytical side, the empathetic side, those have to coexist. You have to maintain this emotional equilibrium. And then again, back to this nuanced you can be much more nuanced, thoughtful in making decisions where you're taking the whole picture into the frame, asking opinions, opinions where your team members feel both supported and sometimes challenged. I'm not saying everybody gets a free pass. It's okay to challenge people in a respectful way. Challenge them with questions. So know their whole lesson. So this goes past the emotional realm as well. Work-life balance, being fresh at work, being tactical versus strategic. Many people swing way too far the other. You have to have that balance. And the balance between discipline, because we got you must hold people accountable. They have to get their own time. They have to follow the rules. But you also have to have some freedom. That's where you have to free your mind a little bit. Be balanced. You have to learn the art of overlooking at times. But not past the framework that's instilled. Being good at balance in fact, and it impacts a leader's effectiveness. The effective leader's health as well. I have to have that conversation with certain people. If they're working hard, they're frustrated, they don't rest, they don't take their downtime. That's not balance. You don't realize it when you're coming to work mentally tired and drained and frustrated how that affects your team. So get your rest, take your downtime. Last one, this is the one that my father drilled into me. And to this day, it's the best lesson he ever taught me. And it's Jocko's fifth tactic. It's the principle of extreme ownership that holds a leader must take full responsibility for their team's performance, especially when it's not good. Right? I and Jago both advise making smaller, quicker decisions that can be adjusted as needed rather than waiting for a massive, overreaching, overarching solution. It's not just taking ownership. It's just not a directive, but a philosophy that can significantly elevate your team's performance. Take the heat. Take the bullet for them. Have their back. But also, and I, again, I mentioned this last week too in this conversation with 
this emerging leader is another one of the things that came early into my life or the 16 reasons why employees don't do what they're supposed to do and 14 out of them when they're not doing it is your fault. You cannot blame it on your team unless you can go through the inventory of those 14 items and check off that you did each one of those perfectly. It's always your fault when it's not working, people. And it's always their fault when it does. But you must be completely accountable. And rather than deflecting blame, looking for somebody to lay it off on, or even waiting for the perfect solution, again, make these small, quick decisions. Let's just start here, work on this one bite of the elephant at a time. And this certainly will this approach will speed up the decision-making process, create ownership on their part as well as yours. And when you own the outcome, it sets an example for everybody else. It's a great environment that you create when you do that. It's an awesome, high-performance culture. It's okay for people to make mistakes too. And when you're playing on defense all the time, if you're playing to just not make mistakes, man, are you stifling your ability for your team to be effective. It's hard for them, anybody to perform under that. It may be very comfortable for you, but it is not good for the greater of the population. And very often we forget this is the second point of all this. When things go right, you have to celebrate that. There's, I've stopped more than a few folks in their tracks. When they come to me, they got a big smile on their face. We just had the best month we've ever had. That's awesome. Congratulations. What did you do to celebrate? Silence. Oh, I guess I should maybe do that. Yeah. You should do that if you want it to happen again. Celebrate your success. It doesn't have to be a super, super Bowl party or something. Just celebrate it. Buy a cake, buy lunch, hand out awards, have fun with it, but celebrate it. You need a continuous feedback loop. I it's a big part of the, the framework, the competency-based framework I, with all of my clients, we build into their companies. And part of that is a continuous 30-day loop. It's a sales team, it's a weekly loop. But in most of the rest of the organization, it's a monthly loop of feedback performance, good and bad. We don't hide the bad. We celebrate the good. As I've said many times, people want to hear how they can get better. Tell them. Don't withhold that information from them, but do it in a respectful way. Most importantly, do it with asking questions. Another whole lesson. So let me start wrapping this up. Extreme ownership in everyday leadership. So Jocko and Leaf's philosophy. I think resounds profoundly with my own experience. It's one of the reasons why I love the book so much and how I teach leadership. And the one of the most fundamental principles I learned from my dad and have incorporated it for years is owning my responsibilities. No excuses. God, if I heard that once, I heard it a thousand times. Don't make excuses. And don't be a follower. Be a leader. Which all fall, all of this falls into my motto, which you've all heard before, if you listen to me before. No matter what business, we're in the people business. That fits into all of this. I don't care what level of MBA or PhD or education you have. I don't care how much experience you have. I don't, your knowledge is certainly valuable. 
that will not make you successful, make you knowledgeable, but it will not make you successful as a leader. You must understand the people side of the business. You must embrace that. You must understand it's your people who are going to make you successful, not you. Your leadership, but you alone cannot create success. Your team must support and join you in that success. And the better you are to understand in the people side, the soft skill side, certainly these five tactics to effective leadership, the more you can embrace those, practice those, the more effective you're going to be as a leader, no matter what business you're in the people business. Drill that into yourselves. Live by that motto of mine. And I firmly believe that empowering people valuing their contributions, and most importantly, taking extreme ownership of everything, everything that happens under your watch. It's just not about being in charge. It's not just about being the boss. It's about the impact you as an effective leader can have to change the course of your team's performance, just like the boat exercise. Losing boat, better leader, becomes a winning boat. So from the perspective of delegation and development, there's that delegation word again I bring up often. You must always be keeping in mind when you give people opportunity to lead that you're just not giving them and just not solving an immediate problem. You're nurturing them. You're nurturing the next generation of leader. You need to build new leaders within your organization. It's one of the biggest contributions you can make to not only your organization, but to yourself. So in conclusion, the principle of the book, Extreme Ownership, is as simple as it is profound. The success or failure of any mission, whether it's in an unforgiving battlefield or in the dynamics of today's business world, it rests solely on the shoulders of the leader. And to gain maximum performance, I kind of, you can finish that sentence. You must improve your leadership ability. And you all can. But you need to find the resource that, re that resonates with you. You must learn it. You must apply it. You must practice it repeatedly over and over until you get it right. It's the 10,000 rule syndrome. You keep doing it, you're going to get really good at it. But you have to be patient. It takes time. It's not going to work the first day. It's not going to work on the 10th day, but you're going to be better on the 10th day than you were on the first day. So the key takeaways from here include the importance of listening, building strong relationships, practicing discipline, striking a balance, and most crucially, taking ownership of outcomes. These aren't just lessons for Navy SEALs or Army veterans. They're universal teachings that every one of us can apply to becoming better leaders and consequently better human beings. Thanks for joining me today, as always. And if I've inspired you to look for more guidance for your leadership journey, please visit our website, RDL Training, Romeo Delta Lima Training.com. We have all the tools and the resources you need to advance you to advance your team or what I call the transformational triangle of change. You can start for only $47 a month. Thousands have. I'd love to have you join me as well. There's a link in the show notes for you to take a look and sign up. There's no commitment. You can quit at any time, but leaders don't quit, y'all. So if you get some inspiration out of today's podcast, please share, subscribe, comment on the podcast, depending on what platform you're listening on. 
This helps our algorithm to be seen by more folks like yourself, and you really be helping us out. Thank you so much. Thanks as always. And we'll talk to you all again next week.